put on this computer. Um, so yeah, greetings everyone. Welcome to the fourth Exalt Dialogue. And yeah, Exalt is stands for the, the Global Extractivisms and Alternatives Initiative out of the University of Helsinki, which is an initiative that began in 2019 or really in 2020. But it's really to kind of open up a critical space to kind of talk about the issues of resource extractivism or knowledge extractivism and anything related to kind of the extraction or grabbing of material. And so this is the fourth Exalt Dialogue series, which is specifically designed to kind of open up and have critical conversations about issues that are near and far from us. And today we will be getting into a very interesting and, and maybe very Eurocentric topic with kind of our speakers today. But we will be talking about really how public money is being used and appropriated to kind of expand or make more friendly the extraction of resources and control of land in Europe. Um, and again, so I just want to say now is your time to exit if you were worried about being recorded on here but, and that this is being recorded. But so I would like to introduce this a little bit and kind of where this Exalt Dialogue came from. So it's, it's actually work that more, at least initially, that kind of really came, came out of the, the political ecology of counterinsurgency, as we can call it, that was really looking at the kind of governmental, corporate, and, and kind of, and maybe even just kind of local authorities or elites in terms of how they were spending their money and what they were doing to try and to really engineer environments to kind of pacify resistance and to, to get what they want. And often what that is was, was minerals, hydrocarbons, water, and land in general, and sometimes forestry. And really, there, there's no limit to this. Whatever can have money be made from it, it was about what efforts would be done to kind of do and control this. And so this came out of looking at the lens of counterinsurgency, which is, as people are more familiar with this as a military doctrine, often deployed in the Middle East or Vietnam. But it actually is a rather extensive and complex kind of military doctrine of actually how to control and manage people and populations, which, as many people know, includes bombing and scorched earth maneuvers and terrorizing a population. But it also equally, if not more so, involves actually more subtle and some might say even liberal or enlightened efforts to, to persuade, to, to kind of convince, to capture the hearts and minds of people. And so this is actually how things that we might consider to be very normal and even kind or desirable, how these things are actually used in a way to actually convince us to maybe work against maybe our middle, long-term or short-term best interests as people which becomes rather complicated, especially when we start talking about ecological or socio-ecological affairs. So where this, this talk comes from is really looking at how these efforts are being deployed right now in Europe, specifically since this kind of idea of the European Green Deal and this new effort towards critical raw materials. And so this idea of expanding mining drastically to actually encourage a green transition and to kind of promote environmental sustainability and climate policy, which as anyone with any sense about them should actually be looking at this rather critically and skeptically, the fact that right now more mining is actually being called environmentalism and being environmentally and climate friendly. But so before we get into this, this is really, this is actually maybe even really a personal conversation to academia in terms of actually how academics are implicated in the knowledge production of actually working for companies and, and pushing to actually work with different industry, companies and governments to actually convince people that it's okay to mine, it's okay to take the water and that there's gonna be friendlier and nicer types of mining and this is all done for the environment. And for me personally, this raises a, a personal issue in, in, in terms of actually how a lot of my colleagues in academia because they, because their desire to be intellectuals, because their desire to be academics are really, are going to anyone who's the highest bidder that will allow them to keep a place in the academy, that will allow them to actually join and have kind of material and also social status within society and academia. And this raises the, the problem of actually ethics. It raises the problem of people's political positionality and what they are doing and, and really how the more that the, the common jargon term, you know, the neoliberalization of the academy. So that means more, the more that the, the university is less independent, the more that it is 
designed to actually fulfill government, but also business imperatives, raise bigger issues, putting greater pressure on academics to more or less take grants or jobs from the highest bidder, which in essence turns them into mercenaries. And I'm saying this in a negative light when really a lot of these efforts, and like I said, this idea to kind of persuade or to socially engineer something, this isn't necessarily done from malintentions. This is maybe done because these visions might actually be what they think is the best way, or maybe an uncritical belief that mining is great for environmental policy and the climate, and that this is the only way to electrify and to build as fast as you can more wind turbines, solar panels, and hydroelectric dams and bioenergy facilities, maybe not looking at the larger society and also the energy grid uh, in general, in terms of the addition and how a lot of the low carbon infrastructures are being added onto thermal, nuclear, and other energy sources. So with this it is really, I think, trying to open a dialogue for researchers among everyone to really look at themselves critically in terms of what their politics are, what they're thinking, and what their role is in academia, and to really ask, you know, what is, what is going to be a way that will maybe prevent crisis, or more importantly, what, what will encourage better qualities of water, soil, forest, and relationships and that maybe sometimes preventing crisis, or I think for a lot of the initiatives we'll be hearing about today about how this, this effort to prevent disruptions, to prevent social friction or conflict, are there's immense efforts to do this to actually prevent shareholder value and to push over these kind of these policies. But now I'm starting to talk too much, but this is really looking into the way that, that mining and different extractive experts are being socially engineered. And with this, I'd like to take, a, we'll take a gander, we'll hand this over to Boyana, and, oh yeah, and more importantly, let me announce this here. So we have Buena Novakovic, who will be now talking on kind of issues and efforts being done by different kind of European governmental and, and corporate bodies to kind of push through extractive efforts of lithium in, in, in Serbia. And then we'll be looking at Nick Volker, who will be showing us and getting into maybe some issues in Portugal, but really the wider kind of overview of some of these funding efforts. And then we'll be looking at Andrea Brock, who will be showing us some of these, these issues in Germany, specifically around coal mining and maybe some other things. But so with this, I, I hand it over to Boyana to look into what's going on in Serbia. So thank you everyone for being here. Thanks, Sanda. Um, I wasn't expecting you to throw such a big challenge out to academia, but I would actually throw it out to even, even the super well-meaning um, academics who you know who travel around and study counterinsurgency um, I would throw out to everybody because I think even um, my experience has now led me to believe that even and maybe even especially academics who are studying the successful techniques of local local groups with the best of intentions of publicizing those efforts and making those efforts accessible to other local groups across the globe are actually in a way um, benefiting companies, collecting information for companies. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it really is a conundrum because we need it, but what, what's more important? And I don't know, I don't know the answer, but, um, yeah, I certainly didn't even know what social engineering was, um, before August of this year. So my name's Boyana. Um, I work as the coordinator of the campaign Marsadrine in Serbia, which is a national, um, campaign against, started against the Rio Tinto lith proposed lithium mine and then sort of became something that was more against lithium in general. And um, we work directly with local groups and also other national groups um, on, I guess, a very specific aim to to um, ban lithium mining from, from Serbia. We don't want it. Um, and let me just, so I'm just a little disclaimer. So I'm not an academic. I don't know the fancy terms. I learn new terms every day. Um, and I think my aim here is really to sort of share, um, the perspective of really someone who didn't know anything and how I came to kind of understand what was actually going on and what social engineering is and particularly academia. I'm someone who like started started talking to academics and scientists with an open heart because in Serbia, our experience is that our scientists were the, the first ones that spoke out about the dangers of 
this specific lithium mine and then the dangers of lithium, lithium extraction on fertile soil. Um, so we have an incredible relationship with the academics in our country. And the more that sort of I met international communities, I realized that actually this wasn't the case and that a lot of international different, different local groups in different areas, particularly actually in Portugal, were very suspicious of their scientists because they worked for the companies. And um, so this is all very new to me. Um, also, I've never done a, um, a, what do you call it, a PowerPoint presentation. So here we go, guys. Um, let's see. So here we are. So um, I'm just going to let this play while I sort of explain. Um, I just don't want sound. Good. So, um, so our campaign, along with a bunch of other civil society organisations, um, worked on really publicizing the Rio Tinto, Rio Tinto's intended lithium mine in this very area. So the video that you're watching, this is the valley where they'd like to put a mine, where they'd like to put um, uh, a processing plant and also um, obviously landfill and tailings dump. And um, the, I think from the very beginning, the unity between several different groups, local groups, civil society organizations, um, wannabe politicians, academics, um, led to what were in the end these huge blockades um, that influenced sort of pre-election decisions of the government um, and, uh, and led to the cancellation of Rio Tinto's project. So Rio Tinto's been in Serbia since 2004, it's when they registered their company. And so for 20 years, they've been these really, really, they present themselves as very hardworking people who have drilled 5,000 drill holes. Um, you know, they're gonna bring prosperity to the Serbian people. Um, they're gonna bring prosperity to this region. I, um, and, you know, for us, it's a, it's a conundrum. These words are really, sort of confusing because what is prosperity to a region with, you know, a valley that sits between two rivers that sits, um, that produces food, that has clean water sources, groundwater sources that mean it, um, that crops actually yield during, um, during droughts in summer because the groundwater is so, so rich with nutrients. Um, and, you know, a, a, a it has a school, it has shops, it has a post office um, and hundreds of landowners who don't want to sell their land and don't want a mine in the area. So all this talk of prosperity um, and all this talk of um, money and, you know, our president's even said that people in the area will be able to throw money around in the streets. That's how rich they will be. Um, we decided along with a bunch of these other community groups and national groups, you know, we just don't negotiate. We're not going to speak to the company. Um, we're not really interested in speaking with them because we, we didn't have an interest in speaking to the occupier. And so my only experience of sort of social engineering before I came into contact with these European funded projects was kind of the social, um, the social warfare on, on the ground. So there's armed, armed private security in this village. Um, there's um, the houses that are sold, you can see here, I think, but it's very hard to see. They they look like ruins. So, so some of the houses that have been sold have been de half demolished. So not entirely demolished. So it looks like a war zone. And kids, when they walked past these places, ask whether, um, whether there is a war again. Um, the interesting thing is Rio Tinto doesn't have a single license and doesn't have an EIA, um, but, you know, they, and I think the psychological games that they've played have led people to believe that there actually is a mine in Europe or that it will be there or that they have permission. They invested $2.4 billion into this project without a single a single permit. So that, that was my experience until I randomly, thank you, social media, got, um, well, not, not me, actually, the March Sabrina campaign got this message from a completely random person, don't know who this is, have never been in contact with this person again. And the message said that in Ireland, they're having similar problems to the one that we're having with Rio Tinto. There is this project called the Vector Project, which is being funded by the EU. Um, and it involves Serbia, Irish Midlands and Germany. 
And my only sort of confusion about this was how come there's a project that so targetedly like is looking at these areas when Serbia, when the project, when the Rio Tinto project has been cancelled. So, um, and by cancelled, I mean, this was a political decision before an election and the government won the elections based on the fact that this project was was not a problem for them in, in the lead up to the elections. So, because because the general public believed it. So I looked up this vector project and with my limited knowledge, to me, the most interesting thing was this sort of this sort of little panel, the first panel here, that the goals are to meet the objectives of the EU, uh, that in order to meet the objectives of the EU Green Deal, we require a sharp increase in the supply of raw materials. And so to someone like me, I just don't even, like I don't even understand the premise of this. Right to me, to our community, to the to 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 locals, to and by locals I mean Serbians. I'm not saying like absolutely local farmers or anything like that. I'm I'm speaking about us as locals, as a local community, from Belgrade all the way to the other valley. This this whole premise of the EU Green Deal requiring a sharp increase in the supply of raw materials. It's like a weird, it's like a it's like one of those complicated math mathematical equations that has the incorrect premise. So whatever you get to at the end, it's not valid to us. Um, and then this, this idea of understanding the complex social, environmental and technical challenges and how they interact. And this got me thinking, what are we talking about? And then there's all these com complicated graphs. You guys might understand these. Some people might understand what this, I have no idea what this is. I still don't understand what a vector is. I still don't understand how, how they call themselves vectors. I've looked up the word vector a thousand times in the dictionary. I've used it in my normal, like in my in my day-to-day -day speech, but I still don't understand how vectors apply to this arrow, apply to this project, what they're doing, but what I'm interested, like I, I find it interesting that the word social vector was there. So what I did was I actually got in touch with um, some friends from different communities internationally and nationally and said, you know, there's this project, there's a bunch of scientists working on it. Why? when the Yadad project is cancelled, right? And one person got back to me and said, I know one of the scientists on this project. That scientist actually did their PhD in social, in, um, in social licensing in Romania on a project that this person was working on. And she relayed the experience of having to deal with that kind of science to me. And, um, and she also met, mentioned that this person had never actually come to the village that he was writing about. So then we found out that, um, ignore the, ignore this thing now, ignore the thing, because I'm going to talk a little bit and then I'll get back to the, to the PowerPoint. Then we found out that that person had also actually gotten in touch with some of our colleagues and in the written communications, that person had never mentioned Vector. So they'd mentioned other project that they work on. They'd presented themselves an academic, but there was no mention of vector in the written in the written material. The person presented themselves as very friendly, wanting to to navigate, like wanting to understand communities and this and that and the other, um, but never never had written down that they were working with a vector project. Um, and in it, it's interesting because we we. We conducted some internal communication mentioning this person's name, and I think that internal communication leaked to the press, so that person's name has been in press. I just kind of don't mention the name in, in case, well, I know that there's definitely people from um, from the project or from the companies here, and um, and obviously I, I know I know and understand that you know that it's very useful for them to be to be at this gathering. So, um, and I'm going to tell you guys a lot. So just imagine what I'm not telling you. Um, in order to sort of protect some information, but it it was interesting that um, that that we realised that actually no one had presented us as a vector or as a social vector. So when we found this out, we yeah we we you know we wrote some internal emails just to tell people that we've decided not to speak to anybody from the vector project. And during these internal emails, what was interesting was some people got back to back to us saying, yeah, they offered me a PhD and I didn't take it, like they offered to pay for my PhD or whatever. So it was really interesting to start understanding 
how academia works because I had no idea that any of this was on the table. Like to me, social engineering was just social manipulation on the ground. Um, and it was very obvious and it was about dividing the Serbs and it was about figuring out how we argue because we argue so much, you know, there's so much internal conflict. I mean, this is not a secret. And I think, you know, I think sometimes companies want to find out how to divide and conquer. And it's like Serbs are very good at dividing and conquering themselves. So just like you guys don't, we don't even need you for that. Um, and I actually think that's one of our big strengths within this movement is that no matter how much we infight, we know, you know, we know who the enemy is here and and we're very, um, we're very good at kind of focusing on that. So here's something super interesting that I found when I started to kind of look through these questions was through this, through this website was Vectories neither for nor against mining. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Let me see whether they offered any money to anybody campaigning against mining, because it's obvious that they've offered a lot of money to people who are for mining, because I, I love kind of following the money. And that's something that I do know how to do. Um, and they hadn't, you know, like none of us had been offered any money to help them with their research. None of us had been, you know, none of these groups, none of none of the scientists who we work with had been offered any money, which is interesting, because if you're if you're saying you're neither for nor against it, and you've got a very pro mining approach, particularly even just on your website, it, it's, you know, it's a huge problem. I mean, it's it's so obvious. So then I started to look, okay, who is Vector? What a, What is Vector? And it was really interesting for me to go, okay, there's these things called social vectors, and I really don't know anyone on this list. But then I love these geoscience vectors, because here's Rio Tinto. So all of a sudden, Rio Tinto is not a multi-million a multi-billion you know dollar corporation the second biggest mining company in the world but it's a geoscience vector which i think is pretty awesome because they've been they've been presenting themselves as a humanitarian company in serbia for the last sort of five years since you know since these public attacks have started on them and there's a whole bunch of other mining companies here and consultation companies um and so they're partners and so i'm assuming that partners means they donate to the project right i don't i don't know um, and then I look at the fact that this project, the total cost of this project is 5.6 million euros, which is super interesting. And a lot of that money kind of goes to the, co the coordination team from Germany. Um, also, these guys from Germany were, um, interestingly enough, behind that amazing environmental, those environmental laws that the whole of parliament kind of got up to clap about. So it's interesting that they're working on on that while working on a project that's studying how to encourage communities to, to accept mining. And then of course I found, you know, University College in Dublin is also a, such a partner and they get a million point three euros. And then I found that Rio Sava, the company in Serbia, uh, Rio Tinto company in Serbia, they get 10,000 euros. And it's an interesting amount because they get tens of millions of dollars from Rio Tinto, if not hundreds of millions a year, you know, on, into their bank account. So this this really symbolic sort of amount of money is interesting, particularly when I thought back to our meeting with the EU, um, the EU ambassador in, Ser in Serbia in November 2021, which was actually the Monday before the protest that led to the blockade started. So that was kind of the first, that was that was the beginning of the week. And he assured us and told us, and this is in meeting minutes, that the EU does not support support the project, like has not shown any official support of the project. Um, and, um, and at that time, Angela Merkel had come to Serbia, it was in her last week of her chan chancellery, and she had said she wants out our lithium. So there was a lot of, in, there was a, there's a lot of, things to prove that that wasn't the case but this is interesting because wow this European project which is partnering with Rio Tinto is all of a sudden donating this tokenistic amount of money to the company but the project's cancelled like there is a legal um document with a cancellation for the every permitting procedure for this project is annulled so I'm super confused I still don't know what social engineering is um, but I know something's up. So I love my FOIA requests, FOI requests. So we, you know, we coordinate an FOI request for the project agreement. And of course we get rejected. And so then of course we have to write um, uh, a confirmatory application and work with some lawyers. And of course that always costs money. And of course we don't have 5.6 million for our project. Um, but we've put together this confirmatory application and while we're waiting for it, for the results of that confirmatory application, um, I'm kind of looking at different elements of these, um, of what social engineering is, because at that time, I think, I think 
by that time I had met Xander and by that time I had read his address to parliament about the Horizon Project and that was what um, it, that blew my mind because I had never seen in writing sort of so clearly what was being done. I didn't know it was a science. And I think that's a really important thing for every academic to understand. Like I had done interviews with PhD candidates who are my friends who are here, by the way, hello. I had done interviews with outsiders, PhD candidates. We don't really, have, they're very busy, so I don't have time to like talk to everybody, but PhD candidates like on my list were like, yes, you talk to them. You should talk to all of them because, you know, they're making the effort, they're doing the research, they're going to, it's going to be data, it's going to be this, it's going to be good for the community. And this was the first time that I was introduced to this concept of social engineering and that actually hang on. The more information you collect from me, that means the more information the company knows. And despite your best intentions. And it really scared me. And actually, it, I want you guys to understand that it affects personal relationships too, this stuff. Like this project affected my personal relationships with my friends who are academics, who I had to confront and say, hey, I'm not speaking to you about this anymore on record. Like we're done. And I'm not talking to anybody anymore because what I'm understanding and what I'm, what I'm hearing here is that you can write anything about what we do and the company can just say, okay, cool. That's what they're doing now. Here's how we're going to counter it. Cause we've got this bunch of, we pay $5.6 million worth of money, euros to these scientists to tell us how to counteract that. And so I kind of got to this point where I was like, I think the only really valuable ac academic stuff is like analyzing the company's techniques, you know, like that's great. That's great for us. That's great for the company. Um, but I don't know, I, there's no solution here. So anyway, it was interesting. We, I started to kind of do more research. And one of the things that this scientist had sent to one of our community members, community leaders was an old proposal for like policy developers that he had had about, about the most polluted area in Serbia. And it was like, this could be funded by the EU leader program supporting rural development. And this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, do it. Like fund this, support rural development in this area that's being poisoned by Zijin and, you know, a copper mine. And there's all these sort of really interesting kind of ideas and promises and it can be a green, you know, com community project. There's all this stuff. And I'm like, where is this? Like, why haven't we seen this? You know, this, this was an idea from years ago. This scientist put this together. Like, where is where is the will of this scientist to come in and like and do this? And I'm and so I start to question: What is he doing this for? Is he doing this just conceptually so that someone then goes, "Okay, I'll do it," because um, we don't have the money, we don't have the time. And so anyway, I keep researching and I go onto this YouTube video of Vector Project. I don't understand what any of this means. I put this together so that you guys can see these fancy visuals that are like what are these visuals? And when Xander told me to do a visual thing, I was like, oh, I just want to tell a story. You know, I don't want to do visuals. I can't read them. I don't know how to keep up. I can't listen to the person. And so the, these visuals are sort of well-intended, I guess, for people to understand things better, but there are people who kind of can't keep up with this. And, um, and he was one that really interested me, which was this, which was this sort of explanation of this zone, these, these zones and it's super interesting to see how large this zone is over the Balkans, but Yadar, Yadar the cancelled project, is the focus. Um, these are all the well-meaning, beautiful research partners. There's Rio Tinto right there. This is another, you know, wonderful thing that I don't understand. And then there was a, then there was a, a woman who put this illustration together. This was what I was interested in, so social vectors. And she mentioned, she said, in these photos... Um, this was the vector presentation, by the way, their launch. So she said, in these photos, there are no local groups here. She said, these, these are the pictures that kind of the media portrayed, but none of these protests have local groups. And she sort of mentioned that this was a common problem. So here's the thing, guys. This picture from Serbia, this is it here. This was in The Guardian. This was a picture from Belgrade. What it didn't mention and what The Guardian did not mention, despite many letters I've sent them and they'll probably never talk to me again, was that these blockades were the idea of local communities. 
that the blockades didn't just happen in Belgrade, they happened in local communities, that uh, over 100,000 people were on the streets all over Serbia. Some local communities, they can't come to Belgrade because the police are stopping them. So that they decide strategically to stay in their own communities and block the roads there. So this well-meaning scientist is presenting this picture of what could be the start of a revolution as something negative and mentioning that local communities aren't involved, but actually they are, they are very involved. And in that video that I showed you at the beginning, you saw smaller clusters of those local communities in their spaces, doing what they can to bring attention to this problem. So um, the, the social vector scientists mentioned Australia as, a, as, a, um, as an example. My, and you know, luckily I'm an Australian and a Serbian citizen, so this really interested me. They mentioned how mining contributes significantly to Australia's economy and how actually a lot of people strongly agree with that in Australia. This is some tally they did in 2014. They mentioned how mining is important for Australia's future and prosperity and how, you know, a, this bunch of people strongly agree with that. And that mining is, that there's, these, there's these graphs, you can see them yourselves. Mining is not necessary for Australia. What they did not mention was that firstly, the mining lobby owns Australian politics, owns it. Prime ministers have been voted out of their prime ministership due to the mining lobby pressuring their party. So this happened with Kevin Rudd. Um, publicly, what, what happened there was that it was claimed that he was a megalomaniac. But really, what happened was that he just didn't play along with mining. It was one of one of the factors. Um, and so it's, it's so interesting to me when I see these fancy graphs, and I know what what the reality is, and I can't scream at the screen to say, hey, guys, come on, like, if you really want to be scientists, can we have a conversation about what science is in this context? And can we can we talk about the actual science of this? So okay, why, why are these results this way? Um, I was really interested in this concept of shared values, which also they mentioned. But again, um, very confused by, by all the graphs and all the things. Now, the um the the women who spoke at this thing here, let me just see here. Um they also mentioned Wayana, you're course. a bit over time. Oh, am I? Thank oh, you for telling me. I can yes, just finish yes. then. Amazing. Thank you. I, I, I'm not looking at the clock, so thanks for warning me. No, it's fine, Let, but no, take a minute to kind of to end it the way you want to. I don't mean to rush it too hard. No, 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 no. You can rush me. It's totally fine. I'm I'm thank you. Thank you so much for warning me. I can't see the clock while I'm doing this because I don't know how to look at the clock and you know like do everything at the same time. So, um, so I wanted to just say something that the vector the vector scientists mentioned in this thing, and I'll finish with that. You know, Sarah Gordon in this in this in this um talk mentioned that just because there are some juicy rocks in the ground doesn't mean that there needs to be a mine there in terms of how they work with the communities. So I really am interested, and maybe there are some people from Vector here. If that's the case, why are you researching a territory where the mine has been cancelled and the people don't want it? And revo like revolutions are about to start and people are about to, you know, do all sorts of things. Why are you in Serbia? Um, I'll end with this. You know, members of our network have decided not to talk to any of the Vector staff and we're not going to meet with people whose job it is to divide and conquer opposition and mitigate real concerns in the view of paving the way for new mines. And to put this simply, you know, it's important that people who are greenwashing their way to rural areas are not the same people who are posing as environmental conservationists. Um, and we use this phrase, the future can't be green if it's only green for you. So I'll end it there. Thanks, Xander. Thanks for your patience. No worries. Said beautifully. And it's, I, if anything, I want to keep hearing this story. This is an amazing kind of breakdown and, and kind of expose of this. So Thank you so much for sharing this and, and the experience of this. This is really important. And it's for me, it's phenomenally interesting. I, and I imagine for Andrea as well to actually see this kind of this outside agitator narrative being deployed, you know, in, in terms of actually, which is very common among every type of street riot across the world, wherever there's a type of social disruption and there's an attempt for governmental management, there's always this outside agitator coming in. This is is people from the outside or this isn't local and these these kind of subtle attempts that are very common in the media to divide and conquer people. And, and I think there's so much more to talk about that you you said and, and thank you so much. And hopefully I really look forward to after this that seeing some of the people here talk amongst themselves before opening it up. But again, Boyana, thank you so much for that. So let's move here to Nick, who I think will maybe be giving us a bigger overview and, and talking about Vector as well, which I'm extremely excited for. 
also. Take it away, Nick. Hello. Okay. Thank you, Alexander. Um, thank you for the invitation and to your team for putting this up and uh, organizing this session. Thanks to Bojana and Andrea, um, who we'll be talking with. And I'm curious also to uh, hear the views of the audience later on, because I know there's, there's a bunch and there's a whole set of, of people listening in, I guess, and that's a good thing from the start. And um, I'm joining you from Central Portugal today. And um, when uh, this invitation came in, I was uh, still uh, doing other work, mining related. My profession is being a software engineer, so I do this in my, in my spare time whenever it's possible. Um, and I'm the co founder of a collective called Mining Watch Portugal. And I'm maybe just give you the slide so you're better oriented. Can you see it? Yeah, okay, great. Can see it. Um, so um, when uh, Alexander and his team they contacted me, I was still in other stuff uh, related, and but started to uh, branch off kind of an investigation um, because um, the initiative of Mining Watch Portugal is mostly about uh, transparency, uh, gathering information, sharing information um, to um, get. Um, stage more uh, informed people interested in extractive industries issues um, because the mainstream discourse is very much dominated by the policy makers, uh, by the European Union views uh, and by companies that have obviously quite some muscle uh, to move money and thus advertising. And um, I call this one a provisional archaeology of social engineering in Portugal and beyond. So um, it's provisional because I'm two weeks into it and it's just, just the start maybe of something. Um, being a software engineer, I have also a background in the humanities uh, from Germany and then afterwards in Lisbon, um, focusing on um, media studies, cultural studies, and looking mostly into issues of colonial, post-colonial um, conflicts um, and that when interested through the lens of phenomenology um, and looking at these kind of, of power divides and, and also violence. So um, this one um, is a bit to dig down into these issues, making some observations and cross-cutting uh, this archaeology, I guess, uh, with the recent news here for Portugal. I'll brush over the, the government that has been falling in the meantime, also related to the attribution uh, partly of uh, lithium exploration and exploitation licenses. Um, that's a case which is still investigated by the public prosecutor. So um, I'll focus more on more granular, more, more details that have been surfacing since then. And um, in case you're interested, um, I'm using this archaeology in the sense of Michel Foucault, um, but make that accessible also um, to hopefully, hopefully uh, most of you. Um, yes, I've been accused to be a conservative in, in, in cultural studies terms, but I, I think still these um, approaches from the 1970s are very powerful still today uh, in, in looking into these kind of uh, questions of governmentality, uh, of hegemony, and uh, violence. And um, in this aspect, uh, I'm focusing on uh, power relations um, that manifest uh, in the social sphere, um, that manifest uh, in the visual sphere, um, and by that also form a discourse, um, and thus the possibility uh, for certain events and situations that occur. And, um, a sub-branch of that may be looking also at mechanisms that legitimize the exertion of power and also violence in um, justifying uh, certain actions. Um, and maybe in the end I can come back to what Bojana also said, uh, how opposition is delegitimized, and I guess Andrea has also worked on that um, due to her work exactly on, on these points. And what you see here is uh, from uh, weeks ago uh, and it's a, a conflict that at this moment is going on on in Covas de Barroso in northern Portugal. Um, it is the mining company Savannah Resources entering um, lands for to create uh, with, uh, with the machines to create platforms for exploration drills because um, as they have not yet 
been able to um, justify their economically uh, um, economic uh, DFS uh, feasibility study for the project. They are still drilling more holes to prove the lithium reserves present there are really worth exploring and to, to, to make their case uh, to their shareholders. And this is the population of the local village, uh, Kovac Barozo, which has been in the media already for four or five years now uh, due to this mining conflict. Um, they are opposing the machines because they are uh, supposedly entering community land. And uh, people have been using their, their buddies. I mean, this is, uh, I guess, quite a strong image, um, using their, their buddies to, to stop the machines um, entering what they claim to be their lands. And they have made a court case uh, also of the company invading these territories that belong not only to private owners, but to public lands board, and which has a special statute also in the Portuguese constitution. So um, even if there's a threat for expropriation in the future for public utility, um, that would be a, a really uh, first case uh, in, in Portuguese uh, jurisdiction. So um, that would probably um, also take time to, to be resolved. And what, what happened afterwards, um, the, com the, the, the community communicating this uh, alleged in, uh, invading of their territory, um, the, the company, they launched a counter news um, saying uh, that is wrong um, and that they have been acting on, on legal grounds. And so what we, we see here um, is also uh, kind of confronting system of, of knowledge um, where we have a conflict between the traditional community knowledge uh, of land boundaries uh, of private and common land in Kovac de Barroso in Boutiques, uh, and that is opposing, opposed by uh, the company saying that um, they have a digital cadastral register uh, called Dupi um, and they thus claim through a digital uh, register uh, to be the owner of these parcels of land. The problem is uh, in Portugal, north of Coimbra, it's here in the center, uh, there doesn't exist uh, an official cadastre of, of land. So all lands, they are only legally um, constituted through their boundaries with the other neighbor. So um, this, this traditional system is now being still, the, the government's trying this for, uh, for quite some decades now, uh, to implement also digital cadaster for, for these uh, situations. But for the moment, um, the BUPI, the company is climbing to uh, legitimate uh, their, uh, their entering the, the lands. The BUPI is not binding in legal terms. So um, this will be a case uh, to be decided by the courts. And then we have um, that playing a bit into this power game of also uh, visually and uh, in the new sphere excluding certain views. It's um, Portuguese Secretary of State for Energy and Climate, Ana, Ana Gouveia. Uh, she's a strong supporter uh, for the project. And um, uh, so things that surface in the news from the government side are usually in favor of the of the project, and what we can uh, read here is uh, kind of the A to Z from the the traditional arguments um, that sideline opposition. Um, it says the mine will bring new jobs and funding for real royalties uh, to the area, and we have this the second line, the first paragraph that's quite interesting uh, because there is legal disputes ongoing, uh, but she even negates uh, the, the, the legal actions as claiming that they are part of the democratic process, but um, what it actually isn't even in the, in the position probably uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to have a say on the outcome, on the outcome of, 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 of court processes. So um, that's a Portuguese politician quite in the light of everyone questioning uh, the, uh, the legal state um, and powers of the state. And the arguments that follow are also quite usual um, and defending for the company that uh, she sees it as a best practice case. Uh, and we have seen uh, also EU funded projects only collecting best practice case, not to accumulate uh, the worst practice cases. Uh, and 
that she defends that Portugal is keen to show to Europe and to the world that you can do mining in Europe in the 21st century with the highest standards and to the benefit of the local population. Um, it's only that local population apparently has not yet understand, um, understood um, uh, that, that they should abate this, uh, to this kind of ruling. Um, to kind of cross cut this one, I will make a short break. Um, and come to a thing that I've already stumbled upon uh, quite some time ago. Uh, that's about the intertwining, uh, the historical intertwining of mining, of forestry, and the concept of sustainability as such. And uh, it was in the early 18th century in Saxony in Germany when um, the Saxony original chairman for mines, Hans Karl von Kalowitz, published that quite known book, Silvicultura Economica. And this is uh, where, for the first time in history, the concept of sustainability uh, surfaces in literal terms. And it is, in this case, bound to a huge crisis in the extractive industry sector of the Erzgebirge uh, there in eastern Germany, and which was in a huge crisis as the wood needed for the mines construction and for metallurgy was getting scarce. So um, this book was published and he says therein to carry out proper conservation and cultivation of the wood so that there be continuous, stable and sustainable use of this resource. Um, so we have these discourses of sustainability and extractive industries. They are genealogically intertwined from their birth. And I, I think that's quite an interesting uh, thing to look into. Um, also, nowadays, uh, when this sustainability is often uh, interpreted uh, in, in very strict terms, but already then it was intertwined with economic growth and economic continuity. Um, so, and this, I mean, it's applied uh, today. Uh, what we see here is the same uh, Secretary of State, Anna Govaya, talking last week, I guess it was, um, on uh, initiative by uh, mining associations here in Portugal, the Cluster of Portugal Mineral Resources. There is also a state entity, the ELNEC, the Geological uh, Survey. Um, they have founded a, a platform that wants to promote minerals and uh, kind of digging into how to communicate to society uh, the importance of minerals and she says there I hope it's legible um, so the platform was launched as an exemplary initiative uh, in the geological resources sector so um, and she says and continues at the opening event um, she highlighted the importance of working together to promote the extractive industry sector which is increasingly green and innovative so um, that's a statement obviously and um, at the same event when this platform was launched, it's, there were some scientists, now we go, go to the scientific part, or uh, people that, that study this stuff, uh, and then afterwards I will go on and, and show you something of a PR agency, uh, advertisement agency that apparently also was invited and in the boat. Um, and uh, in this scientific study I've linked or I've uh, referenced it below the, the image, um, from the from Lisbon University, Teresa Burgett, um, she advances and says that uh, in this new paradigm um, that we surface that, that we face at the at this moment, uh, that the, the the stakeholder and the community legitimation, what in terms industry terms they call the social license to operate, that it's um, being more relevant uh, than. Uh, uh, than the shareholders of, of the companies, um, because always on these, uh, usually in the, in the business rankings, also social acceptance is ranking very high uh, in the risk assessment of extractive projects. And um, what you see here is also um, uh, nomenclature, a use of words that is already pre-informed. Um, for example, the social license to operate, it's originating from the 1990s, uh, is, was coined uh, by Jim Cooney um, and at a talk at the World Bank, and it was already from the beginning 
used as a concept of, of social engineering uh, to how to make it happen and not how to really get into a dialogue uh, with people on the ground, but how to make it, make it happen and how to find arguments, how to study um, the situation in the sense that uh, this thing can uh, can go forward. And usually uh, um, community groups in Portugal so far and also on the European level, they have refused uh, the designation of social license to operate as a concept that's industry termed and that's not favoring their interest, preferring public acceptance. And that's so far the European Commission in their publications, they had a phase a few years ago when they were supporting social license to operate. I guess what we see now is they retract a bit, um, but what we see still in scientific terms and publications, especially when uh, publications are related with extractive industries and people working with extractive industries, we still see a lot of social license to operate work and promoting this kind of term concept to um, worse uh, uh, acceptance. And um, in the same platform launch last week, Minerals Platform in Portugal, um, uh, there was, I guess, the advertising agency FCB in Lisbon, uh, presented by Edson Atayde. Uh They communicated uh, how that should be done. How should we communicate uh, the value and the importance of minerals also in the energy transition uh, to the people in Portugal? And his examples were quite some. It was half a, or less than half a dozen of advertisings from Brazilian mining company Vale um, reaching from the 1990s then uh, covering the strip when they had the uh, dam breach um, in Brumadinho and they had a massive campaign uh, and now um, the last one was a clip that it has to do with Vale, um, a clip that was launched by Vale this summer. And also what we, what we see in there is a um, thing that's also classic in, um, in the communication or, or the discussion of, of, of violent processes that are violent to the natural environment, that are partly violent to the local populations. Um, you are not shown the uh, actual um, images of the extractive process, the, the means of production, they're hidden, uh, they're substituted by a stand-in, by a spectacle of doing good, of nature, of sustainability, and we see nice drone footage of the Brazilian rainforest and Vale funding musicians and culture and importance. Um, so that's a thing that, that's seen repeatedly, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure uh, if that's the idea. Uh, they, they haven't uh, published the, the, the talk that was accompanying the slides. Um, so that's the idea to, to replicate simply that model of, of Valley Clips here in Portugal, this because I guess uh, the society uh, is quite sensitive, meanwhile, uh, to promotional uh, um, attitudes and promotional clips, so that could be a shot in the knee, but you never know. Um, and we see that also uh, in side lighting ideas, and maybe I, I'll wrap up with this. Um, this one is a clip from North Vault. Uh, I guess it's fair to say that they are at least partly public funded through the EIT of the European Commission, uh, where the funding as such is not uh, made public, uh, but the, it's the um, investment branch of, of the European Commission, the EIT, Inno Energy. Um, and they are funding also the startup of Northvolt uh, with all their battery factories and consortia and also the proposal for a recovery fund funded uh, battery plant, refinery plant here in near Lisbon. Um, and that's still to be confirmed. And in this clip, Northvolt is uh, kind of elaborating on the topic of change, how, how to how, what, what's the criteria for change to happen? And in this image, uh, like six seconds into the video, uh, we see uh, the stubborn, we see the donkey. And I guess that's also quite strong as it um, delegitimizes. Um, and now I come maybe back to uh, this um, delegitimizing um, 
matter pattern uh, that we see repeatedly uh, in also delegitimizing protests. Uh, what we have seen, and I, I can agree to Boyana uh, in Kovac Barozo, where uh, also tomorrow there will be a protest held. Uh, we have had been regular protests in bigger cities, and also on the ground in Kovac Barozo, where the lithium project of the Barozo mine is put forward by Savannah Resources. Um, the legitimization it includes obviously also uh, the, um, the phrase of most of these people there aren't actually from here. Um, Another pattern that you see repeatedly uh, in and around Europe and Portugal is um, the scientific policymakers' discourse uh, and uh, also representants of the expected industries. People are not informed. Um, people just don't know enough um, in a sense that we just need better science communication, of course, pro-extractive science communication. Uh, we see that in uh, education centers uh, in recuperated or partly recuperated mining areas south of Lisbon, uh, where it's for school classes. Uh, we see that in uh, Covas de Barroso itself and in Tiquet, the next municipality, where the mining company has having an information office. Uh, we see that also with mining company um, Fortescue uh, in northern Portugal, where they are uh, interested, we have a team mounted in Porto uh, that's currently working on the possibility for exploration uh, studies in northern Portugal, and, but they are already at the exploration stage, and that's a new thing also for, in terms of social license to operate and, uh, and social acceptance uh, engineering uh, intervene the, 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 the earliest possible. Um, so um, people have come to the, uh, to the conclusion that obviously when there is already a conflict uh, established, it's very hard uh, to get it controlled. So um, the companies are already then now working in the exploration stage, and there have been obviously the already protests also on exploration um, on for lithium here in all over Portugal, and that was thing going on since 2019. Um, this maybe the third of this digitalization. You're, in, you're uh, over yes. time now, also. So when you get a chance, I'll wrap up with this last one. Perfect. Um, uh, the digitalization via the ultimate argument. This is needed for the better of all. Um, and we've seen that by a documentary made by Catholic University of Leuven, also with public funding by the European Commission, um, in which uh, the, uh, the Sami parliament leader um, from Sweden uh, of the indigenous community of Sami is interviewed uh, on their opposition to further mining in reindeer herding areas. And the, the final uh, conclusion that the uh, so-called documentary gives, uh, yes, they may, there may be this conflict, but the suggestion is um, they, they should just accept it uh, for, for, the, for the better of all. So um, there should be major size social uh, interests that would override um, local public interest. And that's also why we see a lot of um, skirmishes, media skirmishes on this divide and conquer, to, to divide the local opposition from the mainstream and from the uh, wider audience in the country, in the, in the continent, um, to, to get the heart, to the hearts of the people that supply or that would sustain uh, local destruction in favor for energy transition and running everything electric and still grabbing onto infinite growth with finite resources. Thank you. All right, Nick, thank you so much. That's an amazing overview and also update for the situation in Portugal, which is rather dire in this moment. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time here. We're a bit over, but uh, let's lead here into Andrea and, and see what we got over there. The floor is yours, Andrea. Great. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Sounds great. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks for the invite and thanks um, everyone for joining. Um, and thanks for Boyana and Nick already for your presentations. You're touching on so many things that I talk about as well. So um, I um, come from the German Rhineland. I was um, I grew up in an area that was very much shaped, socially engineered <laughs> um, by the mining industry. Um, both physically, but also kind of culturally, politically, socially, you know, in an area that um, 
yeah, was really made through mining in a way. And it's often, in Germany, it's often euphemistically called a, a Kulturlandschaft or a cultivated landscape. But really what it means is the one that is shaped by um, industrial development and particularly coal mining by holes that are, um, have been, you know, put into the landscape, um, tree plantations that are compensating for the nature lost by those mining operations and digger lakes that they leave behind. So um, this is presenting some research I did and we did with, with Xander a few years ago, but the kind of still ongoing around um, the kind of social engineering of social acceptance um, in the German Rhineland. And just for everyone who doesn't know, um, this is the Hambach mine, um, the world's largest open cast lignite coal mine in the German Rhineland um, that was started in um, 1978, scheduled to be completed initially by 2045, now probably 2030 because of an earlier coal phase out in Germany. And it's Europe's largest deposit of lignite coal and Europe's largest source of CO2 emissions, um, leading to... Um, a range of ecologically and socially disastrous outcomes, like obviously climate catastrophe, biodiversity, loss, displacement and resettlement of um, communities, entire villages, um, and our non-human animal, <coughs> animal neighbors. And it's operated by RWE, um, uh, Germany's um, largest electricity provider, a transnational corporation that is involved in disastrous uh, energy projects all over the world, both so-called um, renewable and fossil fuel based ones. And uh, RWBE the, holds a pretty unique place in the German political economy because it is so ingrained in um, political structures. It's, it, it's incredibly powerful and um, it is ingrained because of structural dependencies on the company, because unlike other companies, a huge uh, number of the shares that um, make up the German uh, RWE are owned by local communities and councils and cities, etc. So it's often called the single most influential corporation in the German political landscape. Um, it's a really good example, not just for a company that managed for a very long time until relatively recently to really kind of shape and achieve some degree of social acceptance in the German kind of political landscape and the general population, but also for how revolving doors, political lobbying and this kind of engagement, social political engagement has been paying off, particularly with links to um, local, regional, national and EU kind of government and governance structures, as well as the police. Um, the police is worth mentioning in particular because for a very long time, the head of the police force in the Rhineland, um, who was responsible for policing protests against the mine, which have always existed, was actually a board member of RWE. And it only kind of, that only ended when um, it kind of was made public a few years ago. So here you just see kind of quick snapshot of some of the financial and political entanglements of the corporation. Um, and here you just see a couple of um, like, um, screenshots of recent funding that RWDE has been getting from different national um, uh, EU and um, local um, government institutions um, for some of their projects. So they're involved in all kinds of green, so-called green and, and other kind of projects from gas um, to coal to renewables um, and very much framing those as, you know, beneficial to local communities, etc. The most recent one, which I wanted to ask you about, Nick, at some point about is um, they've just gotten, I commissioned a new um, solar farm in Portugal, the south of Lisbon. Um, and that all contributes to the kind of much more recent effort of positioning themselves as, you know, green electricity provider. In addition to a green mining operation, to which I'll come to uh, in a moment. Just quickly back to the mine. So these are some of the ecological and social impacts of the mine, the forest destruction of one of the oldest um, forests of Europe, the Hambacher Forest, over 12,000 year old with a range of threatened species, um, the destruction of um, local communities um, and the social fabric and their, um, the villages around the mine, including here you see a local, uh, small cathedral that was um, 
destroyed um, a few years ago. Um, and yeah, lots of homes of non-human animals already mentioned. Now, from the beginning, that the mining operation was strongly resisted ever since 1978, approved in the midst of the panic around the oil crisis. Um, and um, what you see here, some photos of um, an now 11, 12 year old um, forest occupation by people who essentially occupied a forest in order to protect, protect the remaining uh, ancient forest, the Hambacher forest, and stop the mine. And some of the kind of actions that um, protesters have engaged in over the years in order to um, make mining difficult. Um, so let's move on to the social engineering and green mining. Um, Xander already talked about the importance of kind of the corporate or the counterinsurgency thinking to understand some of the actions that mining companies um, have been engaged with like since the beginning of time, but um, here and now with focus, of course, in, in, on the German Rhineland in order to get a, what if you want to call it, social license to operate, social acceptance, and present them as, as green and sustainable. So it's really interesting that that source you just showed, Nick, about the kind of long history of um, mining companies' efforts to, uh, in kind of doing that. So what we look at here is um, the way they engineered consent and repressed resistance. Um, Zander already kind of explained counterinsurgency. Here's a, a short definition. David Kikalin, a competition with the insurgent for the right and the ability to win the hearts, minds, and acquiescence of the population. And the idea of this range of counterinsurgency measures of the uh, social engineering of consent is really to isolate the radicals, to cultivate the idealists, and educate them into becoming realists, and co opt the realists into agreeing with industry. So it's a really like a kind of divide and conquer approach um, to. Um, towards the kind of resistance against the mine, both locally, but also more nationally, um, that you can really see play out in the Rhineland until today. So we've kind of divided these into soft and hard counterinsurgency strategies. I'll start with the soft counterinsurgency strategies that you see in the Rhineland. Um, Sandra, please do be very strict with me with time. I forgot to, to start the timer, which I had next to me. Um, so just tell me to, to stop. Um, so we'll start with the soft counterinsurgency uh, strategies around uh, corporate communication and astroturfing to engineer consent. So we all know mining companies all over the world put loads and loads of money into public relations uh, initiatives, corporate social responsibility initiatives to paint a kind of particular picture of um, you know the, the, them being a responsible corporate uh, neighbor or corporate citizen um, that kind of gives back to local community that involves um, particular kind of framing images, of course, um, censorship of publications and critiques of their operations and like promotion of um, their own propaganda and material to, um, to, to kind of paint this particular image. Um, going back to the important role of uh, academics for to support the, the work of mining companies uh, early on, RWE, commissioned a large scale um, report, uh, acceptance study, the power of participation um, that investigated um, social, like local communities' attitudes towards large projects, including mining companies, um, and that allowed them to kind of use some of those findings. Um, they've learned from that kind of, um, not just that study, but the wider literature very clearly by emphasizing repeatedly over and over again their kind of openness to dialogue and stakeholder engagement, which obviously key kind of neoliberal pacification devices um, with local communities um, by showing their kind of, you know, openness to kind of constructive critique, et cetera, and um, engagement with political stakeholders as well. Um, other other parts of the um, kind of corporate communication astroturfing um, dimension are public events, museums, exhibitions, information centers, so physical and social kind of infrastructures that are displaying uh, again, like uh, showing their kind of corporate social responsibility um, behavior or initiatives, etc. They offer tours through the mine. Um, and through the uh, offsetting sites, uh, the recultivated sites that are um, meant to offset the destruction they're causing in terms of kind of local net habitats and nature. Um, 
they're involved in astroturfing, so the setting up of fake citizens' initiatives and um, NGOs, websites that are allegedly coming from local communities, but really um, are, um, have RWE employees behind them pretending they are local pro-mining kind of community organizations, um, et cetera. They work with researchers, um, a lot of biologists, ecologists, um, natural science researchers in their comp in their nature conservation work in particular, but also engineering work, um, and um, bring them together regularly, kind of for like meetings to just you know to kind of show their show their results and um, get like a clap and like a public you know photo with RWD personnel, etc. Second one is. Um, um, oh, this is just a kind of one more like recent picture of their efforts to present themselves as as having moved on from um, from mining towards more renewable forms of energy production. Uh, here you see some of the kind of tourist infrastructure they've created in order to turn the mine into an, what we call an extractive attraction, like um, to showcase the the work they do. Second one, uh, sponsorships, buying consent. So um, again, like most mining companies are involved in um, sponsoring anything and everything you could potentially possibly ever sponsor, whether that is um, firefighters and police barbecues, sport, sports club, football clubs, carnival association, more traditional festivals and events, baking carts, public bookshelves, uh, bookshelves um, Etc. in order to kind of uh, increase this positive perception of RWE in the local community and bind to people to RWE. Um, just this year, um, to celebrate the 125th anniversary, they've set up a new RWE foundation with 125 million that is uh, euro that is meant to sponsor local um, charity work, essentially, to bring about lasting change in the social sphere and make a difference. Um, third, we, thirdly, and I think particularly disturbing, is RWE's involvement in schools. Um, so they spend a lot of money on to getting into schools, doing lobbying in schools, um, providing educational and power material to schools, teaching supplies, um, um, lessons on energy and electricity generation. They give out lunch boxes to first graders and to bottom right, and essentially um, do anything they can in order to bring their own messaging about energy, energy security, uh, etc., into into schools. They have agreements with schools that um, involve like schools um, organizing kind of these trips into, for instance, power plants or um, other kind of RWE infrastructures. And yeah, as I said, RWE employees, including these energy ambassadors coming to schools and providing um, lessons. Um, they provide environmental education and tours, um, and they sponsor the RWE Zoo School that provides biology lessons. Then we have um, new recreational infrastructure that uh, around the mining area, everything from hiking tours to this kind of new extractive attractions I showed on, on the photo, uh, cycling and hiking infrastructure, new speedway, a new signposted cycling network um, framed as the tourist route through the Rhinish Lignite mining area, really facilitating the kind of exploration of the whole area uh, through the kind of through tourist eyes, so to speak. Um, so it's also involves a restaurant bar, information center. Um, they sponsor football stadiums that you see at the bottom right here, school auditoriums, museums, VM platforms, exhibitions, etc. Um, here you see uh, Robbie Williams, who just performed a few months ago at a for um, I can't remember how many thousands of RWE employees as part of the celebration of 250,000 uh, of 125 years of RWE in the football stadium that they sponsor. Um, and then lastly, a lot of this kind of social soft counterinsurgency strategies, we have, of course, the nature conservation work, which I find almost the most interesting because ever since the very beginning, RWE has really put a lot of um, work and money into nature restoration in order to kind of gain social local acceptance, social acceptance, right? So where I grew up, my, my house, my parents' house was built by a mining company and the whole area is essentially replanted and reshaped after having been mined um, with, you know, plantations, um, uh, recreational areas, etc. 
Um, but more recently, this is quite explicitly framed as compensatory work. So like a net benefit to the local nature, a net gain of trees. Um, so these kind of offsetting programs that, you know, have speak the kind of more recent like neoliberal language of um, market based nature restoration work. And that's been possible through the enrollment of uh, nature conservation NGOs. Um, but um, RWEs always kind of work with prominent German environmentalists and academics for biodiversity protection at a high level partnership with the ICUN, IUCN, which was very, very much criticized by IUCN member organizations around biodiversity offsets and biodiversity conservation more generally. And they were founding member and the PLEV always played a leading role in the Better Coal Initiative, which is meant to improve the kind of environmental sustainability of, of coal, but is essentially a way to outsource any kind of criticism towards um, outside of RWE. And then we have uh, kind of two different kind of uh, what we call harder counterinsurgency techniques, prosecution, imitation and intimidation and physical violence. So that involves stigmatization. Um, and framing as eco-terrorists, extremists, violence, and criminals abroad from abroad of those kind of more radical protesters against the mines, so to say, the people who live in the forest and people who kind of maybe take the right action to stop um, the encroachment of the mine onto the forest and other kind of surrounding areas. We have intimidation of um, local residents, uh, you know, um, destruction of car tires, nightly phone calls with threats, rape threats, etc. Silencing through state structures, so local city, uh, city council, political interventions, etc. And classic divide and conquer strategy is like asking residents to distance themselves from more radical forest defenders and other protesters, um, etc. Um, and then lastly, we have the physical violence against forest defenders, uh, journalists, and also some residents by RWE security forces and police forces, um, the use of pepper spray um, and other weapons, uh, buttons, et cetera, um, dogs um, against, um, against uh, forest defenders and protesters. And um, so these kind of um, harder, counterinsurgent techniques of physical violence is kind of, um, we are invisibilized through this kind of, the, the, these softer techniques, the kind of more public facing stuff, um, the kind of public narrative work, et cetera. Just really quickly on the, on the kind of collaboration with police again, one thing that's often criticized in the German media is the close collaboration between RWE security forces and police forces. So um, the police will use RWE vehicles when policing protests in the mine, for instance. They use their equipment. They work hand in hand. They sometimes take orders from RWE security forces. So that's been kind of quite well documented by forest defenders and other activists. And then I just want to briefly, how am I doing on time? Take one more minute. One more minute would be ideal. Okay. Uh, and then just really quickly, I think the green mining and the kind of uh, nature conservation work is particularly important for this social engineering, um, which is why they've put a lot of money in it, but they also really kind of sell it. So um, this is an in a, um, a quote from, from someone I interviewed from RWE. Uh, we from RWE make two products, sheep electricity and pretty new landscapes. And they're really, they're really proud of these new, new landscapes, right? So these are some of the offsetting sites that they um, have created over the last few decades in order to compensate for these losses, but also to essentially get rid of the overburden that they got out of the mine. Um, but I want to just show you two pictures uh, quickly to finish off. Um, as I said, this is also really celebrated, right? And it's obviously more important to RWE that people actually know about these efforts than the efforts themselves. And this is from an advertising video that showcased how RWE, friendly giant, is usually called energy giant in the in German, in Energie, so RWE, um, how the energy giant uh, in this video kind of walks around and um, not just produces electricity through obviously this kind of renewable and quotation mark sources, but also repairs the damage it does. So you see the astroturfing in the, in the top left, and this is the final kind of astroturfed area that RWE has created um, in this video. So that speaks to this idea of spectacle and spectacular conservation 
that Nick already mentioned, and it feeds into the relationship between ecotourism and mining um, and how both the mining areas and the offsetting areas are turned into these extractive attractions that um, local people are almost you know, proud of. And you have tours through the mine and the offset side, people coming from neighboring countries to see them and kind of um, admire how RWE is like creating this kind of enormous hole and using the world's largest machines, um, et cetera. All right, I'm gonna close here now so that um, so that Sandra doesn't get annoyed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrea. No, it's excellent. It's excellent to, yeah, all this stuff is really important for people to know. And yeah, no, everyone, everyone went over at least five minutes and it's fine because I think there's, there's only three people and some went over more, but it, it was, for me, it's really great to hear these and to see these three cases kind of together. And I'd just like to take an opportunity for people now who are here, Nick, Boyana, Andrea, if you, if anyone has questions for each other in their cases that they'd want to ask. So please, anyone step on up. Yeah, I have a question for Andrea. Um, I'm wondering about, because obviously the theme of this talk is public funding. So I'm actually wondering about whether you know how much money went into the policing of, um, of those land protectors and how much public money was wasted on intimidating people through the use of police tactics yeah thank you um i don't know the exact numbers they won't release the exact numbers uh, we know that the big eviction of the forest occupation in 2018 which lasted for weeks um was the the most expensive policing operation in the history of the german police but we don't know how much it actually cost and we do know they bring in police from all over the country um for these operations um, quite regularly, I mean, as they do in, in other countries as well. Um, we also know, um, I mean, RWE gets a lot of indirect public subsidies anyways for the coal mining work and now also for the other work. So some of this, the, the slide that I showed kind of more towards the beginning and more recent EU funding and, and government funding, but they're all for kind of hydro, um, for um, gas and other projects, hydrocarbon projects. Um, but um, we also know that uh, another way their work is indirectly subsidies, subsidized is by the state taking on some of the costs, quite a significant part of the cost for resettlement and rebuilding of the villages that are being destroyed, as well as the kind of moving off or the re resettlement, so to speak, of um, highways and other kind of road infrastructure that is being destroyed by, by the mine. So those are some of the kind of most expensive uh, most important ways that pro these projects are um, publicly funded. In addition, of course, to the fact that the very coal phase out has like led to huge compensation for RWE for like having to shut down their coal mining operations. Awesome, thanks. Boyana, okay, Nick. Just a remark uh, here from Portugal. Um, yeah, um, I can only confirm what, what Bujana laid out and especially also what Andrea talked about. Um, we see all this kind of marketing flowers around here, but maybe uh, the astroturfing, um, we see uh, that's quite a, a preoccupying uh, activities at schools that are co-funded between uh, the European Commission via the EIT in energy and uh, local uh, mining companies. This is an initiative called uh, Minerais Estão Vida, uh, Minerals Are Life, um, and this also includes um, a university, Nova University of Lisbon, uh, EIT Raw Materials, um, the Portuguese Cluster for Mineral Resources. Um, so um, at the same time, the funding is not uh, publicly available, uh, so as the EIT of the European Union is Oh, it's not a public entity, but a private entity enterprise. Uh, they don't disclose funding agreements, and um, they involve the entities as such. The schools have so far not made public also the agreements and how they uh, evaluate the content that's usually um, um, brought uh, by by the companies themselves or by the industry association of the cluster for mineral resources. Um, then we see the greening. Uh, we see solar parks. 
just recently Almina in Abu Tejo in the Southern region, a uh, copper mine. Uh, they uh, created a solar park um, uh, in, in old areas. So we see all that, that uh, bouquet. And uh, on the astroturfing uh, in, in Florence in Spain, we see uh, this initiative in uh, northern Spain uh, where the workers of the local mining company, they are put uh, into uh, demonstrations or just in to, to promote, uh, to, to keep this mine working as it's um, under, under threat to, to be closed down due to non-compliance. For now, we, we have, don't have that in Portugal, but obviously we have these promotional uh, campaigns uh, by the companies and unfortunately also by entities that are state funded. That's, that's, that's the thing. I, g I guess um, when it's on uh, the funding, when it is public, these things should be transparent and they should also be ethically transparent in the sense of who makes it uh, and, and where does the money come from and, and what objectives. So that's, that's maybe the thing about it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. It was Andrea and his work that made me first aware of, of, of this kind of uh, structural thinking on the on the cover of Jesus. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. And if you could put your microphone closer to your mouth, it, it sounds a bit low, but it's still hearable. Thank you. Before we open it up to everyone, we already have a, at least one question, maybe two in the in the chat. Do, is there anything between the presenters today who'd want to ask each other? All right, so let's get into it here. So, and yeah, and people in the chat, please write in a question and I'll read it to try to have it not get so kind of crazy. I think we're gonna, we're gonna try to give 15 minutes more or less to do some questions. All right, from Tony, interesting cases of corporate anthropology, congratulations. Nice to participate and listen. However, some time ago there was Lament because companies did not communicate, shared benefits, had dialogue, and engaged with the stakeholders and local communities. Now there is lament because such activities are practiced and developed. Never happy. All right. I think this is this is a fun one. Um, I think I've seen this name before. Does anyone want to speak to this? I would love to. Um, because I, I I lament a lot, and I appreciate this Shakespearean um, term as well. Lovely use of language. Um, so I think there's like there's two elements to this from a local standpoint. One is that the dialogue, the the like publicly, the companies sort of sort of say that they're engaging, but they strategically engage with people who want money from them. So there's it's it's hard to like find the admittance of like public discourse for pe of people who kind of don't want it and what i can tell you happened in serbia was that rio tinto in a lot of their documentation even to their even to their shareholders or even to the public claim that like they've held a hundred you know public awareness sort of um meetings and things like this you know they, they've they've held like pr meetings and online webinars but none of these um, meetings are actually legally mandated or part of like the legal structure of 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 um uh of the regulation of like Serbian mining law. So what we've been saying is we will be happy to come to a meeting that's going to be recorded where our lawyers are present and dis discuss with you where meeting minutes will be taken. But there's no point in us having like a tete-a-tete -tete or a lunch, you know, like something that's like akin to a lunch, a collective lunch. And actually um the the one of the initial meetings that they had where Dragana Djordjevic who's a chemist went and asked for questions you know they didn't have answers to her questions the community invited her they didn't have answers to her questions the company didn't have answers to her questions and then she she came to another public meeting and they had banned like someone was told to look out for her and not let her in so it's not that we're never happy it's that like it's that the this idea of engaging also needs to happen with, with a bit of an idea of I guess a strong I, I think it also needs to happen in spaces that have strong rule of law you know these companies kind of come to spaces that have really really um sh shattered democracies and so 
there always seems to be a ganging up of like the corporation and the government against the people. So um, yeah, I'd be happy. We'd be happy to take one of the legally mandated meetings that's recorded. And, you know, even, even in private conversations with the company that, you know, they've reached out, we've said, cool, let's meet. Will lawyers be present? Will it be recorded? Oh, no, no need. So that's like, that's where the conversations end. You know, if this isn't something that's, that's going to be publicly available, that everybody can be involved in, we're, it's just not, we're not going to do it. It's not lamenting. It's actually just trying to be transparent, which is one of the things that they say they are. So we're holding them accountable to that. Nice. Andrea, Nick, does anyone else want to speak to this? Andrea? Yeah, thank you. I think my big problem with all of these, uh, you know, consultations and dialogues is that they're essentially PR exercises, right? And they're they're a bit like, um, you know, the free prior and infor informed consent uh, processes that Zander criticizes in some of his work, um, that you can't say no in them, right? It's just about a shaping of something, totally ignoring the power relations around the table and the fact that at the end, RWE will take the decisions anyways. So they drain energy from local kind of communities and activists. They used to divide and conquer and cause divisions within the kind of um, activists and community um, kind of um, area or like the people between the people who are actually active in the area. And they used to justify um, the operations that RW is engaged in. But you can't say no to them because the aim of local communities and those resisting the mine is never going to be met. RW is not going to stop mining or stop mining earlier or mine less or in any way forgo any of their profits because of these the consultations or stakeholder dialogues. They're just used in their neighborhood magazine that is sent around the local community to showcase that they are good corporate response, socially responsible neighbor. Well said. And uh, I'd actually like to just, just say something really quick on this is that even in quote, well-established or stable democracies, it stands up also being governments and companies against people. But, and really just to piggyback on what Andrea said, a lot of it is, is about the seriousness and quality of these things, because I've sat through many consultations and sat through an FPIC procedure, and, and it's everything Andrea says, and it's also what Boyana says, is that when it comes to the really serious, actually scientific debates and questions about the impacts of electromagnetic currents, of water quality, of soil, of tailing dams, of these procedures, they're not had. They're not had at all, and a lot of the scientists who are trying to bring quality to the conversation are silenced, like Boyana said. And this again ends up being about consultation, not consent, not a right to say no, and it's not legally binding. And, and exactly as Andrea says, is it ends up being a public relations exercise and that it, it really has no substance. And the biggest issue with free prior informed consent is that you can get any number of people, you know, you just have to get some indigenous people to agree to this. And so this is usually an exercise of grabbing certain elite landowner elements or people that aren't necessarily thinking about the different animals or trees or have a certain type of environmental relation. And it is the company using and grabbing people to kind of tokenize approval and consent for these things and not having the deliberative process that Boyana and Andrea have just stressed. And so I don't want to take up time, but I think this is an important aspect to remember as well. I need to add something to this, Sandra. Sorry, I, like, I feel like it's really important that like, what you mentioned about Dragana, for example, you know, like even in this question, it's a really interestingly written question. It's very emotional. It kind of places like we're lamenting and then we're lamenting and we're never happy. And it's like the role of like these so-called communities is always the emotional role and like the company and the scientists, they're always like really rational. But actually we're asking for what is regulatory, like what is our legal right? We're asking for these meetings. We're asking for the meetings to be systemized. We're asking for the conversations to be very unemotional. And yet I think it's really interesting the language that's used, like that's used even in the questioning. Um, and I think that happened with Dragana particularly because she's a woman. So there's all this, like she's a crazy scientist. She's this, she's that. She had all these sort of, these sort of attacks on social media and things like this. And um, it's a really important thing to talk about that kind of the, the, the feminine, identity that's placed on this side and then like the rational that's on that side and actually no we're being rational it's just that we also have emotional reactions to things <laughs> well said no thank you um i'm going to try to move us along we're getting the questions kind of coming up a quick one maybe for anyone who wants to take it could the aspect of green mining be touched on a bit more does, <laughs> does someone want to say that 
I mean, I, I can. Of course, usually green mining refers, well, the, the way it's often used is now to talk about kind of um, mining for so-called green renewable technologies, etc. cetera. But um, the way I use it in relation to, to RWE and the way it's actually like RWE is positioning themselves is to actually paint coal mining, which is obviously in like lignite coal mine, the dirtiest form of fossil fuel um, uh, generation, energy generation, as green through its uh, efforts from the beginning to um, uh, and the money put into nature conservation and restoration. So, and I mean, actually, if you look at it closely, the nature conservation restoration work RWE does is not bad. They do create quite unique ecosystems in, in these restored areas, although they can never compensate for the loss of a 12,000 year old um, forest. But my, my argument is that offsetting nature compensation work through offsetting is integral to them painting themselves as green and as um, framing their operations as a temporary use of the land. So they go, they do some mining and then they repair it and make it better than it was before. So they really push this idea of a better nature that they create and that they leave behind when they move on and a better future for local communities because these areas will be turned into massive lakes. So the Hambach mine in 2080 is meant to be Germany's second largest lake. They're already, you know, kind of selling, um, promoting the fact that house prices are going to go up, etc. So it's the idea of better nature, better future through these really green operations, um, despite the very dirty, dirty fossil fuel bases they're kind of, you know, grounded in. Thanks, Andrea. And, and of course, in that case, you know, where are you going to get that much water? It's a huge hole. You know, what, you know, what is the quality of ecosystems? What are the ideas of private property that are are kind of imposed and subjected onto these things? So I, I think, yeah, well said. Let's, oh, my chat just jumped. So let's move to Elsa. I have a question. To what extent are some of these social engineering schemes or their parts recognized as greenwash greenwash dishonest manipulation by some important stakeholders or environmentalists interacting with these groups? Does anyone want to take that? Oh, and I guess there's a caveat by, by from Elsa by a mainstream environmentalist because I am worried this work countering, I can't see because this the countering, some non-ecological practices fall too much on the shoulders of those impacted. Does anyone want to speak to that? I can, but I have been speaking a lot, if anyone else. So I no, go ahead. I feel guilty that I went over time, so go ahead. I can I can also jump in. Please. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, for example, just um, one example I, I, that I think did not come to fruition, but there was an agreement signed in Portugal between one of the major NGOs uh, we have uh, here in Portugal, uh, environmental NGOs, uh, and the Industry Association Portugal Mineral Resources uh, Cluster, um, and they made an agreement to launch a project on social licensing, license to operate. Um, but I guess that never went forward, at least as public information is concerned. But there is obviously um, also, for example, WWF is endowing the concept of socialized to operate in some publications uh, of years ago. Um, so there is borderlines. Um, and I think in some cases, also other NGOs, they join in and it's sometimes not um, plain greenwashing or bad intentions. Um, it's a very specialty area and uh, um, I guess it's not common knowledge, also not on uh, an environmentalist sense um, uh, to know about what social license to operate is, what social engineering is, and, and how to work with these terms and concepts and, and what the pitfalls are. Uh, because it's a, from my personal understanding, it's a very well-formed trap uh, to uh, people to say, oh, great, let's just dialogue. This gives us a voice. Um, but it's it's forged in a way uh, from the beginning uh, to create consent and to manufacture consent, uh, either on a local level in um, drawing these energies out of scarce personal resources of um, 
communities that are in themselves uh, marginalized um, in, in very much cases, um, drawing energy from, yes, from struggles that have uh, far uh, uh, more important issues at the moment there. People, they, they simply don't have the means, uh, the personal means uh, and bodies to, to, to accompany these, these processes. Then they, they, they just squeeze um, the, the resistance. Um, and plus, then you have um, uh, the engagement in this process often involves uh, internal divides um, by uh, there needs to be representation because these processes, they always require hierarchy. Um, they, they want to implement hierarchy too, Worse, um, I mean that's obvious. But I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking at it always in a in a case to case thing um, because a lot of NGOs they simply don't have uh, um, uh, the means or the knowledge at at regional levels. For the WWF, I guess that's a conscious decision. Awesome, thank you. All right, so I'm going to take two more questions. I'm sorry for everyone who didn't get it. We're still going to actually go over time and make this a bit of an extended exalt dialogue, but I think it's really important to try to try to do this. Um, so Mark asks, my favorite question is always this, what do activist groups need to do differently? What mistakes have they made? Who wants to take it? Oh, I, me, of course I'm taking this. I think what we need to do differently is not answer questions like this in public forums when we don't know who's listening. Like, I appreciate the question, but what I've come to realize is that answering this question, even to the most well-meaning of outsiders, is actually really damaging to us um, because this is, this, is, this is a company question. I don't know who you are, Mark. Maybe you're everybody's friend, but this is literally the kind of questions that get us feeling insecure about the failures of thousands of years of, like, environmental, you know, activism or whatever you want to call it. And it, it makes us feel like we're not doing something right. And I think it turns it turns the needle onto the onto the land protectors. And of course, we talk about this stuff. Like, of course, we have these conversations. But I think I'd like to keep them internal, you know, and um, and not answer that that here. Um, yeah, that, that's it from me. <laughs> nice, fun answer, Andrea. Do you want to say anything to this? Somehow I can't actually find the question anymore. There's so many responses to all of the questions. They all get lost. It was like, what do we need to do differently? Yeah, it says, my favorite question is always this. What do activist groups need to do differently? What mistakes have they made? Yeah, I think I, I partly share Boyana's point. Uh, I think there's some things one can say publicly, and I have said publicly, I think, like, Pushing back against the divide and conquer is probably like one of the most important things, strategies, the kind of not allowing us to self-police and movements to police us, like NGOs and kind of more established groups to dictate the agenda and to police how people behave in resistance movements. I think those are some of the really important points that I think I want to make. Awesome. Thanks so much. And this will maybe, be our last. Maybe just a, a oh, remark on that also. Um, the question is kind of odd to me as uh, it assumes uh, 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 homogeneous them uh, against us um, uh, in the sense that it doesn't look at the particularities of local struggles. Uh, it, it kind of falls into the uh, this pitfall of assuming that the arguments, the errors, uh, they repeat or they are the same. Um, I guess the, there is a multitude uh, of responses to this, and but they would have to be found on on individual local levels also. Um, actually, engaging on a horizontal level with whomever is inquired, um, I think it's very hard to to, to give a generalist response to that. Awesome, thanks. I'm gonna make this the last question. We're now, this is technically when we should end, but I, let's try to extend this to Emily Robinson. How can we ensure the longevity of quote, no mining areas such as, such as the mine at Jadar with the current projections of minerals needed for the green transition and with the behavior we've seen repeatedly from mining companies, which is held, held up by governments and even the automotive industry it seems like there is a strong possibility that these areas might be explored again in the future, as highlighted by Boyana's research where funding is still being directed towards Jadar. Unless we have a clear 
framework for maintaining no mining zones. Does anyone want to take that yeah, up? Yeah, I'll I'll just I'll just touch on this, um, and I'll just finish up on Mark's um Mark's comments because he's kind of spamming the conversation. Um, this I think this exalt is about the problems. It's not about us proving what's what the solutions are. I think it's really important to know what the topic of this exalt is and that we're sticking to that. So um, in terms of this, yes, the other stuff is really interesting because this lithium is going to stay there. So we might kick Rio Tinto out, then another company will want it. And I think that that's a really interesting um, uh, sort of um, thing to understand and to know. And I think that's something that everybody's very aware of. Like as long as we're alive, we will be protecting this this bit of land and it's not just that bit of land it's like it's the whole of western serbia which is which is sort of sought out for its lithium um and um yeah i i think it's it's a great point to bring up but it's definitely something that we're aware will last generations and generations and that's just how it is i think russia montana is a really great example in romania you know whether they had a gold mine there um the battle to to get the gold mine cancelled took 10 years then it took another 10 years to have that area unesco protected and the local activists and the coordinators are still in court because russia montana is suing them so twin this is a 20-year battle you know and and the area is now protected but the company still wants to like make money from the activists who defamed them so that's how it is all right I think with that, it looks like there's a lot of other things in the chat I haven't seen, but we have to bring this to an end. And and yeah, just on this last note, I think it's, you know, these struggles against infrastructure, mines, and in defensive land and territory, they are lifetime, if not generational struggles in terms of living in place and continuing to develop a relationship and to try to protect them the best you can. And it's it's uh, it's all case by case. But with this, I want to give a special thanks to our speakers today, Boyana, Nick, and Andrea. Thank you so much for being here. I want to give a big thanks to everyone in the Exalt for actually having this platform and making this available so we can have these discussions, especially Sana and Lena for, for helping do a lot of the logistics behind the scene. And everyone for coming today. Thank you so much for being there and, and even putting your questions in there. And with that, have a lovely day. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. See you. Ciao. And I have to figure out how to stop recording and to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Andrea, if I just end it, it automatically saves the video, right? Yeah. Sana, I hope you're there. I think you're not. But you can also just click the record and recording click thing. The record there, is, there is a thing. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's there.